first films of our successful Earth shot from the cameras on our orbiting spaceship. Despite the poisonous oxygen-laden atmosphere, signs of a civilization. And then the big news. There is life on Earth. Although no landing was attempted on this trip, it's obvious we've got a lot to learn from the Earthling. Now, first close-up shots of that Earthling. Here we see him at dinner, a carefully regulated meal, after which he takes shelter for the night. He needs his rest. As you will see, it's going to be a busy day. For most Earthlings, it appears to be all play and no work. Anything that stands in the way of the smooth, fast life is not tolerated for long. Loud honking and squawking brings a worker on the double. If you're thoroughly confused listening on an audio platform, the joke is, the dominant life on Earth is the car. Hey, if you're on an audio platform while you're at it, leave us a review. Help people know we exist and that we rock. And no matter where or how you partake of our program, if you love what we do and want to support us, subscribe to our Patreon for as little as five bucks a month for all kinds of goodies and extras. And if you really, really believe in the message and you want to get involved, reach out. Let's work together. All right, without further ado, vroom vroom. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today to transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton, Amanda Smith, and Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. I'm ready too. All right, let's hit this. Let's hit the road. Beep, beep, honk, honk. No brakes. We're fucking rolling. All right. So, today's episode, we're getting right into it, both because we have a time crunch and because I'm pissed, mostly because I spent half of today driving. I spent 45 minutes today in a car, manually operating a machine to get only a few miles. And I'm still frustrated. Everyone else around me was frustrated. And, uh, you know, when you complain about these things to people, they just say, oh, you know, stop being so negative. You know, it is, it just is what it is. It's normal, right? It's normal, right? Well, today's episode is going to explode this I think we have a very exciting guest, an excellent activist, an advocate, an anti advocate for car culture and nimbyism in general, and, and I'm sure we're going to be able to get into those two things uh, and uh, find the intersections and you know uh, blow apart this whole infrastructure in our minds and build up something new. So Matthew Lewis uh, is an activist uh, in Berkeley right now. So Matthew, come on, what's wrong with cars? Cars are great, right? Honk, honk, beep, beep. Cars are great. They're, they're really spectacular machines. Um, they, uh, they build on a lot of our history of technology, innovation, and inventiveness. And they somehow managed to take advantage of the fact that we're really good at making things that, making tools that, that serve our needs to basically turn us into the tools that serve their needs. And that's, that's basically where we've reached at this point, in my opinion. We, the, 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 the servant of technology has become our master. And to, with the worst possible consequences we could ever, I mean, I don't think anybody ever even imagined. Even the fascist himself, Henry Ford, I don't think ever imagined <laughs> causing as much destruction with his products as he has managed to achieve. And, and by the way, for folks who are not familiar with the ha history, I know we throw the word fascism around a lot, um, and I, I'm going to try to avoid being over the top with my language. Henry Ford what, himself described himself as a fascist. He was very proud of being a fascist, and he was so good at it that he actually trained Hitler and the Nazis in how to be better fascists. That's not hyperbole. That's in the history books. The only portrait... Adolf Hitler had on his desk behind him 
guess who it was of? Henry Ford. Fascinating. As a, that is a life-size portrait, by the way. It's I mean, a you have to be pretty, I'm not you have to be pretty insane to have here. a life-size portrait of anyone, yeah. you know, of any, I don't have a life-size portrait of anyone. I, 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 yeah, that's I insane. Have a, so, um, Mountain Valley, I think, back there, yeah. You don't have that's, a that's NASCAR driver, you know, like that's cardboard cutout camera. in the corner of your that's room. Off, that's off camera over here. I don't want people to see that. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Because that would blow your whole <laughs> narrative. Kind of right. whole vibe, yeah. <laughs> so Matthew, um, you mentioned, and uh, we posted quite a few of your tweet threads that uh, are very controversial for people because they seem hyperbolic, like saying things like that cars are the number one killer of children. Like I think about that all the time that like we are so frustrated driving around this machine that is that we defend so heavily that we think about as our freedom that it's like the freedom to be perpetually in debt to oper manually operate a machine to go even one mile in society and you know chain ourselves to this wheel, you know, this, this antiquated I think about people in the future looking back at us and being like what were they thinking? We had the technology to create machines that just very predictably and easily get us on track. And I'm sure we'll discuss that as a solution. But um, yeah, can you talk about some of the statistics and some of the information yeah. out there of the damages of these of these things, these machines, then this culture around them? Yeah, I think there, just to, to complete the little piece on history, because this leads into the statistics. So when, when Henry Ford first started rolling his Model T off the assembly line, these were relatively expensive machines, and so they were really for elites. Um, and so when they first started driving around in our cities, people hated them. you got to remember the era here. This is in the teens and 20s. There was a real labor movement in the United States, and there was a lot of industrial activity still happening in our cities. So you had a lot of workers, a lot of middle-class folks um, walking around, either riding horses. In fact, the real way to get around back then was on bicycles. Um, uh, there was a bicycle explosion in most American cities around the turn of the century, um, after, you know, the Wright brothers who eventually went on to invent another form of mobility, but their first passion, the Wright brothers, first passion there in Kitty Hawk was bicycles. They were bicycle mechanics and, uh, they were a part of a, a national wave of bike mechanics and bicycle inventors who really put the United States on a path, what could have been a more sustainable transportation future. Uh, it's something that people might not know. Um, the pneumatic tire was invented for bicycles by a bicycle mechanic. Uh, pavement for roads. The reason we have paved roads in the United States was because bicycle riders were sick of sharing these muddy dirt heaps with horse carriages. And so we started paving the roads in our cities. So the history here is really of like, again, using these innovations to advance mobility. And then Ford comes along and sort of comes up with a way to start mass producing cars and people hated them. They hated them. You can go around to like newspapers from the turn of the century, teens and 20s, and the editorials and the reporters would all just like, these are a menace to society. They're running people down. They're ruining life in the city. There were protests against them. Um, and so, you know, there was an awareness at the city level that cars were bad. They were bad for cities. They were bad for people. And it was enough where you had like entire organized neighborhoods of moms and mostly moms at the time and other parents saying like, our kids can't play in the street anymore. That was normal in the United States. Kids played in the street. There's a whole history of all these sports that kids invented that were invented in the street, right? Stickball and kickball and, you know, uh, football and baseball. Like these were street sports, <laughs> urban street sports. And the reason they were there was because kids weren't being run down. So then the drivers started running down kids, not just kids, but, but kids in particular, because that was the place where kids would gather. And they needed a way to justify that. And so there's a whole history we can get into later about, you know, how they changed the laws in our cities to make it illegal for kids to play in the street. But sadly, their efforts to ban us people from using the streets that we own and pay for, um, were successful in monopolizing our urban land, but they were not successful in leading to a long time, long term permanent decline in the violence they caused. So you had, you know, 50 to 75 years of progress in making vehicles safer for the occupants, right? So the people in the car, there didn't used to be seat belts. They had these, I don't know if you're familiar with like collapsible steering, steering wheel columns. Used to be if you got in a car wreck, the column, the steering column would go right through your chest, which would be pretty 
uncomfortable. But now they collapse so that that doesn't happen. But, you know, there was no effort to make the outside of the car safe for people. And we kind of had some progress for a while on that, to be fair to the car industry. We were seeing reduced deaths on the streets up until, I'd say, about 10, 15 years ago. And then something reversed. And I'll tell you what that something is. The entire car industry decided that its future was in giant trucks and SUVs. And we now have a raft of empirical evidence that the heavier weight of these vehicles, that the taller grill heights, you, I'm sure you see a lot of them in Appalachian and Atlanta, these trucks that are where the grill heights are like as tall as I am. Mm -hmm. Those, it's almost as if you took an engineer and said, design a really efficient way to slaughter children <laughs> and come back to me. And they'd show you the Chevy Silverado pickup truck. That's what they would say. Super hey, lifted this with thing, lights and spinning, no, no, no. spinning it, wheels. It doesn't even need to be lifted. <laughs> These things off the factory floor have grill heights over five feet tall. And you have two things that happen with that. One is the entire impact area is all the way up to the head of the person, where it used to be down below the legs. If you're in a sedan or a, you know, a normal car, that actually has pretty significant implications for survivability. Because if you get hit in the legs, you might be badly injured, permanently disabled, but you're probably going to live if it's low speed. You get hit in the head at 20 miles an hour, you're done. You get hit in the torso, the risk goes up significantly. So, so the whole car industry pivoted to making these more deadly weapons and deploying them like crazy. And the reason is, of course, as we all know, they can sell them for a lot more money. Um, and there's no safety regulation in the United States to speak of when it comes to the pedestrian impacts of car design. It's just NHTSA, just, uh, there's a group called NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Sa Safety Administration. They don't care about what happens outside the car. And so we've seen a steady uptick in pedestrian deaths. And I do have to say the 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 fact about cars being the leading killer of children, it's no longer, it's not hyperbolic. It's, it's always been true up until two years ago. Sadly, it's fallen to second place behind gun deaths. So, but that's a whole other problem of American culture that's, you know, it's not that the number has gone down. Uh, the number of children dying is still going up, but gun deaths are actually increasing faster. So, yeah. You here where I live. by a different murder machine. Yeah, that's right. It, yeah. Exactly. Uh, here where I live, I can, I can testify to that to some degree. I mean, it's a small number on, on the scale of all the uh, carnage, but here where I live in just the past calendar carnage. year... Two, that's not a funny pun, but that is one. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's been two individuals, young adults, I think one was 18 and one was maybe around 20, that were struck down by vehicles um, on, on the same stretch of road. That just happens to be a highway where those big, super lifted, uh, gasoline chugging trucks like to zoom over the hills. And I know I sound like totally unfair and square right now. But that's that's only two numbers that I know of. I remember a horrible accident in my hometown where a five year old was obliterated in the back seat of his family car as he and his mother and, and sibling pulled out of a road that led to their school because they were headed home. And one of those trucks came over the hill and bam. Yeah. And there's still a memorial there for him today. And that kind of thing happens day in and day out. And we're all just like, oh, that's tragic. No, you can't take my trucks from me. That's my whole identity. The transition of these vehicles from being, so I used to drive a truck. I used to do construction. I lived in the mountains um, in an area where you actually needed four-wheel drive to get up certain yeah. roads. And, you know, I had this Ford Ranger. It was a four-cylinder. It had a real bed. You could actually fit a sheet of plywood in it, <laughs> you know, like a, a work truck. But right. this, this thing, you know, it had four cylinders. It was a two-liter engine. It would get up to maybe 70 miles an hour. It didn't love 70 miles an hour, but it could get up there. But now you right, have these gotcha. things where the bed is too small to fit a, fit, fit a sheet of plywood. That's the first big alarm bell that goes off for me. Because everybody's like, oh, I need my big truck because I use it for work. I'm like, what kind of work do you do exactly where you need a truck that can't fit a sheet of plywood? In the, in the my favorite contradiction truck? is luxury truck. Oh, my God. The leather line trucks that yeah. you don't have an excuse for that. That's not util you know, it's not like a, a utility. The, the, the purpose of that truck, it's like a fortress, you know, it's an antisocial paradise, yeah. Yeah. you know, for somebody moving through the world, feeling like they are above it all 
in this throne above the whole world in a murder machine that no matter what you hit, you're going to kill, you know? Yeah. And I, it really is a crazy thing that that's a status symbol and a, and a sign of manhood. Yeah. That like yeah. that, uh, uh, the side of manhood is for these, these largely like beer bellied, you know, like out of shape dudes Let's to not get, get into too a mean. mech, to get into a damn robot and, and, you know, roll around the world. It's just, it's just not American. I tell you what, I, I just want to say that the, uh, some, somebody said this once and I think it's really powerful that dying in a car like yourself is the most absurd way to die. And I think how absurd it is, is it that we are literally every time we get into a vehicle to go to the grocery store, because I have to drive three miles to the grocery store. I have to cross three very dangerous intersections, you know, just to get food. I mean, and, and I think about the ways that this infrastructure hasn't just, it isn't just this immediate sort of ping, you're dead sort of projectile death. I mean, it is the death of community. It is the death of culture. It is the death of walkability yeah. and a sense of, of integration into society. You know, it's the death of locality. You know, it's like somebody said, who needs speed when you have proximity? Why do you need to go 70 miles an hour when you have a society, Ooh, a society, a good. community that's designed around your needs that you're integrated with that well, you can walk down the street, yeah. your kids can play in the street, grocery store is just right there, there's a park. And the car has killed that. There's a killed whole flip side of that too. It's a very astute observation on your part. But the other side of that is the viability of almost every single sprawl development in the country evaporates if you propose to people that you can only drive 15 miles per hour while you're there or to get there because that's the speed at which it's safe and you don't kill people on the street. Because now they're like, well, wait a second. I only want to drive 20 minutes at 70 miles an hour, at 80 miles right. an hour, 90 miles an hour. It's like, wait a second, you're going through somebody's neighborhood at that speed. That's not like, like just because <clears throat> you don't live there doesn't mean somebody doesn't live there. Right. So, so mm -hmm. in an extreme case here where I live in, in Berkeley, you know, I live in a, a part of town that was severely redlined and segregated for many, many, many years. And so we've got these three roads that sort of, have cordoned off this part of the city and they're like six lanes wide and people routinely are driving down these streets at 50 60 70 miles an hour and so while i don't have to go three miles to go to the supermarket um i go four blocks but in those four blocks i have to cross two streets that where you routinely see drivers killing and maiming pedestrians because you know these people think oh well it's it's somebody's neighborhood but it's not my neighborhood so I'm going to go 50, 60 miles per hour down these streets, and I don't care what happens. It's not my problem. And I think this gets at the root of what the car industry has achieved here, and really Henry Ford's original vision for what he wanted to see happen in society is when you isolate people enough and you give them enough power, they're naturally inclined to these sort of um, totalitarian instincts. You turn on these you know, survival of the fittest sort of ways of thinking where people stop realizing, like, well, wait a second, like, do I want, you know, here's, the, here's the thing, let me just pause for a second. If you go to any wealthy neighborhood where people, everyone's car dependent, where they don't want low income housing and where they very much appreciate having a high speed road that gets them to their house, they're the first people to complain if someone speeds down their street and they'll put up the sign saying, hey, don't speed, my kid lives here. But wait a second, don't they speed through someone else's neighborhood where someone else's kids live? And isn't that a little bit inconsistent? Like how come they can speed through my neighborhood and risk everybody's lives, but then nobody's got to say, you know, they've got something different to say about where they live. And that's the real, so quote unquote, achievement of the car industry is it's really played on this hypocrisy, this inclination to be hypocritical. And people are like, oh, I love the power of the car. I love the speed. I love how it lets me live away from all those undesirable people. But all the things that I appreciate about the car, I don't want anybody else to have that. And that was Henry Ford's vision. You want to go first, Marlo? I got two things here. You can go first. Okay. Well, I do too, but I'll make them. Well, I turn signals things. on though. You can see that I can. Oh, I'm, that's I'm funny. Okay. Blink, blink, blink. Um, so the thing that I encounter the most when I, um, approach people with this anti-car thesis right they're like obviously the first thing is oh that's my freedom you know like that's my right to have a car and drive it as fast as i want and build it out as much as i want and that's i work hard for that you know there's layers of fallacy there but 
the thing that seems to assault people the most and the first thing that comes to their mind is uh, we'll be going backwards if we uh, choose a path of degrowth in a way that people don't have individual vehicles or don't have the need for them, that we go to this mass you know, public transit uh, system, which I'm such a fan of. Uh, how do you address that effectively? And how can one address that effectively while, while tying in the uh, the irony that the car industry started as a way to make things more accessible to people, you could arguably say, and yeah. has inverted and now makes everything completely unaccess or very very much uh, much harder to access. Like uh, like you were talking about trying to cross these dangerous highways as a yeah. pedestrian or in a car. You know, it's affecting our climate, which is impacting um, you know uh, things right down to food sources. Uh, it, it it even takes up so much property that that's property that could be used for housing. Like the car industry has made everything much less accessible at this yeah. point. Yeah. So just bundling all that up, I guess, can be challenging. I mean, and I, the reason I go on and on and on about this is I think this is the hardest question we face as a civilization. I don't say that lightly. Um, trying to get people to recognize the real geometric and physical limitations of their lifestyle choices is very, very, very hard. But I also want to just go back to the history a little bit. It actually wasn't really the car industry's goal to make things more accessible. Right. Um, when, when before the car industry really came on the scene, there was there were few places that were more accessible than American cities. You had trains going everywhere. You had buses going everywhere. You didn't build houses. True. It wasn't a 15 minute walk or a 20 minute walk from everything because nobody would live there. Like nobody mm. would choose to live somewhere that they couldn't walk or ride a bike or catch a train to go. So but now it's designed that way. It was designed. That, and this is really the fallacy of our historical revisionism around here. I'm not saying what you said, but a lot of people who promote cars, oh, well, the United States was built for cars. Like, it absolutely was not. It was absolutely hijacked? was not built for cars. It was destroyed for cars. And I don't mean hmm. metaphorically destroyed for cars. Again, not being hyperbolic. I am saying they took bulldozers and wrecking balls to most American cities and knocked them down to replace the humans who were living there with cars. And that is our actual history. Now, there's two or three cities where you could say it's a little bit different because they came up after World War II, right? So Phoenix kind of was built for cars. And it's a catastrophe. Just to give you an example of how bad it is, we talk about there's this, there's this very tight correlation between the cost of living and the car mandates. I call them car mandates because... People like, you know, you, even you guys are talking like, I don't have a choice. Well, so you don't have a choice. Is that freedom? Is that because no, the government is mandating that you have to drive. And Phoenix is a place that has mandated that for almost all its residents. That makes Phoenix actually one of the least affordable cities in the country, even though it has very low rent. The reason this is so important is because what the realtors and the car industry people will tell you is, oh, well, you know, San Francisco is so expensive because it's like this liberal left place and blah, 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 blah. And Phoenix is one of those cheap cities. That's why everybody's moving to Phoenix. But then you do the math and you look at it. People in Phoenix spend over 50% of their salary on the combination of transport and housing. And you can't really separate those things because if you live in a house way out in the middle of nowhere, you still have to go to work unless you're a trust funder. Yep. But if you live out in the middle of nowhere, you probably aren't a trust funder. So you're going to get in that car. You're going to drive every day. Well, you add up the cost of that driving every day, and it turns out you have less money left over than somebody yeah. living in San Francisco paying three times as much rent as you do. And this is the yeah. piece of the car culture that really gets buried under the conversation. Like Nobody wants to talk about this. Everybody's like, oh, well, Houston is more affordable than New York City. It's like, actually... No, it isn't, because no one in New York has to have a car, and so most yep. of them don't. And guess what? That higher rent, they still save more money per month than someone living in Houston, paying lower rent, and having to drive everywhere they go. And this is the thing that I think I find that to be at least a, 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 a one of those conversations where people have little light bulbs go off. and like, Oh, wait, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. But I think the part about getting people to change their behaviors and accept that it's just a fundamentally non-scalable way of living. I'm afraid, my fear 
um, my cynicism, where my cynicism comes in, is I think people actually have to suffer the consequences long enough to realize I can't keep doing this. It's almost like, it's almost, I, I hate to make the combination because I, you know, I, I'm very sensitive about people who have these issues, but it's almost like a, a, a simulacrum of a substance abuse issue where until you've really had to confront that problem and really face it and realize like, wow, I can't keep making this choice. You're going to keep yeah. making the same choice. And I see that all the time in people who like, Someone who even lives across the street from a grocery store was like, I need to drive to that grocery store. It's like, actually, you don't, but they're just convinced that they do. And I don't know how you get to those people. I really don't have any idea how you get to those people. Matthew, I'm about to explode here with about a thousand different things I want to put in here. But uh, let's, I, let's I, want to, I want you to get to – after this little rant, I want you to get into the bombshell here, which is the cost. Yeah. But first, I just want to kind of pick up on a few things that I was thinking about as we were kind of talking. Yeah. As um, as I just the the insulation of the machine and the perfection of Henry Ford's fascist sort of uh, super mech fantasy that it separates you from other people, it separates you from nature. Yeah. You're in this machine, you're moving un impossibly fast beyond nature. Nature stops being something; it becomes a blur. The people around you in traffic, they stop being human beings. You yell at them, this fucking asshole. Yeah, yeah. You know, they cut you off. You stop thinking about them as a human being. You get road rage, yeah. and I mean, it really shows us the ways that the technology that machines, that the structures of our society insulate us from each other, from emotional connection, from seeing other people as human beings. I mean, it is the most perfect reinforcing mechanism of an ideology of individualism that we are all sitting in our own cars, stuck in traffic. The other day I was driving and I saw, you know, Lamborghini next to me in traffic, you know, car that can go 200 miles an hour, stuck right next to me, it can't go any further. And I mean, what better metaphor for our whole societal design that we have these incredible powers and machines but because of this design philosophy that all ultimately circles back to profits for a certain group of people who have designed society so that we are continually really in, in, indentured to them that we pay into them forever we we are dependent upon them to get any of our basic needs the other thing i wanted to say you mentioned the the sign in the the nice neighborhood that says don't drive fast and you know that is the perfect metaphor i think for law for the mechanism of regulation and law. And I'm not saying I'm against that altogether, but it's like when you have a system where there's a fundamental gravitation and you have this structure that is like, go in the very, uh, this direction and go very fast, that's capitalism. You know, we have this system of, of making laws around it and regulating and saying, don't drive fast. Don't drive fast, don't be greedy, be nice, care about other people, but you're in a machine that, you know, psychologically elicits this behavior and ma literally mandates it into the structure of our society. So it, it all just brings us back to the embeddedness that we have with this machine. I, I worked on this movie a few years ago about an alien coming to this earth. And one of the first observations they notice is that this, these people are just literally destroying their planet so that they can lay this track so that they can move around in these little machines. Have you seen that the animation that I've been to the top of my Twitter thread? Oh, no. No, uh, I have we'll, to we'll, that. we'll play that in the, uh, yeah, we'll play that gotta, in the episode gotta, for sure. You gotta see this, it's brilliant. It's from like 1958. So I, I want you to like, um, yeah. I, I want to try to get into like, like reimagining and, and like really like getting off this drug, this, yeah, this yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, substitute for things. But first I would really want you to, I want to read this real quick. Cause I think, I, I'm not sure if you compiled this information or if, uh, someone else did, but this is just a calculation, um, call This is a site called anti-inflationary us. And it's cost of car infrastructure. And it says, according to a 2019 study by Harvard, the public cost of maintaining the car economy costs fourteen thousand dollars per person per year, per year. And the private car, the private car of ownership is twelve thousand per household, about six thousand per vehicle per year. There were one hundred twenty-three million households in the United States, putting the total public cost of maintaining the car economy at one point seven two trillion per year. One hundred twenty-three million households, fourteen thousand dollars per year. There are 272 million private cars in the United States, putting the total private cost of car ownership at 1.63 trillion per year, 272 million cars, 6,000 per vehicle per year. Together, the total cost of maintaining the car economy in the United States is 3.5 trillion per year. And that that uh, study goes on to include, you know, wars for oil and all of the, you know, maintenance that it costs that it bankrupts cities. Can you talk about that? And this is this yeah. is really the bombshell. This is yeah, the reason yeah. I brought you on this show, other than to go beyond it. Yeah, I think, I mean, and so this is where, this is real, this actual set of facts is what really sort of caused me to question my own. So I come from 
being in left in leftist activism and politics basically my whole adult life. And I, you know, I, I used to be a part of like an experimental currency community in Colorado and like organic farming and you know all that sort of stuff. So, so I, the reason I want to mention that is that is that as I drilled into this specific question around car culture, I really started to question some of my assumptions about both what was really going on here in terms of, is this capitalism? Is this free markets? Is this really what, you know, and I, and I, and I'm a student of that stuff because I really want to understand it both to unpack it, but I sort of have this activism philosophy of, um, winning is everything. Like for me, winning is everything. Like I, I, I really care about ideological debates and I really care about making sure that I'm being honest. But at the end of the day, I want to change the world, really. I mean, I don't know how much I'm succeeding, but at least I'm going to spend my life doing it. So, so, but so the all, reason I say major this, solidarity for the that. The reason I say this is because I have serious questions about, you know, what it will take both to achieve the objective, but also what's the correct analysis of the nature of the problem. And if I can take two minutes just to tell you how I, how I got here. So my, I started my career really advocating for renewable energy solar power, wind power, because I cared a lot about that stuff. Getting, I mean, I, I feel like the oil industry, I used to think the oil industry was the most evil industry in the history of the planet. But then I discovered the car industry. <laughs> and, and part of what became really clear was that oil industry is completely subservient to the car industry. Like their entire product is completely dependent on what car makers do. If car makers stop making cars that run on oil, the oil industry's screwed. Like they're done. I mean, it's it's the largest single share of oil consumption. There's other things we use oil for, but a lot of these marginal oil plays in places like you know North Dakota or even in Georgia, you know, they're drilling for oil in parts of Georgia now. It's like those they would never drill for that oil if we weren't driving SUVs everywhere. But what this really sort of where I really started to sort of we lose you, Zachary. Uh oh. Uh, hold on, just need a new battery. Oh, okay. You can probably keep going. Okay, okay. Keep rolling. What really started to make me question was when I started to look at these costs and I realized, now, wait a second. What, what I understand capitalism is supposed to be about is people competing with products to sell to other people. And the people who are buying the products are going to go for the one that's the lowest cost and provides them with the best value and service. And you don't have to spend more than three minutes looking at cars to realize that that ain't it. You know, yeah. so it started sort of like, so wait a second. So why, why is this thing? And it, and, and it quickly became apparent that what we really have here is not actually a free market. It's not actually capitalism. It's not socialism either. It's closer to Henry Ford's vision where we have a government that is organized around mandating people use these products, not giving yes. them a choice, not freedom, not even capitalism. The right. profits are concentrated in a single industry. So they're not even that widely spread. And you have a lot of rent seekers who glom onto that. So there's a huge share of the economy that's like, okay, well, the United States is organized around the car industry. So how can I make money off of that in one way or another? And that could be sprawl housing developers. Do you have sprawl without a car industry? No, it's a big zero. There's no sprawl without a car industry, right? And you can sort of add on to that. Are there Walmarts without sprawl? No, there's no Walmart without sprawl. You kind of keep going and keep going. You realize like, wait a second. I don't know what to call this. I don't think I'm comfortable calling it necessarily free market capitalism because I don't feel like I have a choice. And here's the kicker. What we know about the economies of places that free people from car dependence is that they're more healthy. They're more robust. They're more diverse. People's incomes are higher. They have better health care. <laughs> they have better education. Yeah. And all those things take money. And so... If you're in this rubric of like, what's the optimal outcome? How do I win? What I'm thinking is, I look at that three and a half trillion dollars that we're wasting on car culture every year, and I'm thinking three and a half trillion dollars every single year. And by the way, it's more than that because that doesn't include the full health costs. That doesn't include, that doesn't include all the actual costs. And we pay those health costs. Believe right. me, one reason our health outcomes in the United States are the worst in the developed world is because we drive everywhere. <laughs> but Let's just say, yeah. let's take for the, for the sake of argument, three and a half trillion dollars, three and a half trillion dollars a year. That buys me universal health care. That buys me free college. 
That buys me a gold-plated high-speed rail system with trains to every neighborhood and every city in the country. Yes. That money buys all of those things. And so I'm thinking, I want all those things. <laughs> I want free healthcare, free college, like affordable housing that I don't have to drive to. And I'm thinking, the system we have actually generates enough money to do all of those things. But we have been forced through government mandates to give mm -hmm. all that fucking money to the car industry. And sacrifice our lives. And, sac too. and sacrifice our lives and all the other downside benefits of it. So I step back from like which economic system is that and which political system is that. And I'm just laser focused on, I want that money. I want that money. I want that $3.5 trillion to make people's lives better, not to make Henry Ford's grandchildren even richer than they already are. And so if that's going to be, the, the reason this is really, the reason this, I think this is so important is because I do think there are people who are persuaded. I mean, the United States is a very middling country politically. Like we're radicals. We would say we're radicals. I acknowledge that. I have a radical point of view on this point, on this topic. I also know that my point of view is never going to dominate. I know that, right? Like I'm here trying to educate myself so that I can become more influential and have some impact. And what I found is that people really do start to think about that cost perspective. Like, oh, wow, what, what would I do if I had 12,000 extra dollars per year that I don't have to spend on my car? And right. so they're, they're not willing to necessarily join you in like, let's overthrow capitalism and bring on like, you know, gold-plated communist future. But they probably will join you like, you know, if I could cut that cost in half, I could save up so I could to college. If I could cut that cost in half, I wouldn't have be so tied to my stupid job where I get health care. And you, it opens up all these other windows for people to think about when they realize how much of their own money they're pumping into this system that they don't even really like. <laughs> like people, nobody's like looking forward to sitting in traffic. Nobody's looking forward to circling the parking lot for a parking spot, right? But they do it because they're forced to. And if there's one thing humans are really, really like su supremely good at, is we are resilient for good and for bad. So if you force us into an uncomfortable situation, we will figure out how to make the best of it. And that's what's happening right now with car culture. People, it's like, I don't think people, anybody loves it. There's car brain people who are like, no, no, car's the greatest thing ever. But that's not, that's like a tiny share. Like they're like, the, they're the other end of the radicals like us. Like if we're radical anti-car people, there are radical pro-car people, but neither one of us is the majority. Most people are just like, I just need to go to work and drop my kids off at daycare. You know, like, right. I, I don't really care about the damn car, right? So what are the little things you can help them understand, realizing, do you realize how much richer you would be? And this is where the, this, there is one piece, I think, in that thread that you mentioned, Zachary, that I think really, this blew my mind, and I found this out about 10 years ago. And this is where capitalism has a potentially good role, at least as a narrative device in explaining. So... For people who have 401ks or retirement accounts of any kind, you know, you, you, your money goes into the market and then it grows at some rate. If you took the money the typical American spends on their car every year and put it into a standard retirement account for the course of their life when they otherwise would be buying a car, by the age of 50, almost every American would have 1.4 million fucking dollars in the bank. Well, we can't have that. That nation, would that would evaporate. We are a nation. The, the wealth gap. It wouldn't. Yeah. Well, it would actually. Everything would get higher. But we. The, the yeah. thing that I say to people is, we are a nation of millionaires, who burn our wealth in the goddamn gas tank. That's um, that's a stark reality. When you're talking about the cost of car culture, yeah, yeah. car culture, yeah. um, you know, all the, the trauma aside, the casualties aside, yeah. the climate impacts aside, the money that we could save and spend on more meaningful things aside. The thing that screams out at me is the fact that car culture and pardon the pun is a vehicle for racial discrimination oh used God, yes. infamously by the incarceration industry. Yeah. I mean, just think of where the police would be if there weren't cars to pull over for, you know, no real good reason and arrest people of color and throw them in jail. You know, like without cars, there probably wouldn't be uh, so much of a chance for people to be um, charged with petty crimes that that impact their lives for the rest for the rest of their lives, you know, and things like that. So when you think about uh, 
doing away with car culture as we know it, I see where you're coming from, where it's like you have some really serious, hefty questions about how could that be achieved? How could we get there, per se, um, without turning the world uh, upside down for Western civilization? Um, and just really quickly to talk to, um, well, to speak to how you say uh, us radicals here who are anti-car culture. Um, myself, personally, I was a little suspicious of the anti-car people for a while when I still lived out in the boonies. And I felt like, well, how do I get my groceries yeah, home? Yeah, you know, before yeah. I understood zoning, yeah. before I understood some of this history, you know, yeah. and uh and, and I come across the term anti-cagers. And let me tell you, some of them will turn you off to anti-car culture because there are some really extreme ones out there. Yeah. But for the most part, I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm quickly becoming one of those anti-cagers now that I live in a place where yeah. I can walk around the corner and get groceries or go to a thrift store or up to a cafe for entertainment. I don't want to drive two cities over to do something, even though I would like to visit that city. I would much rather hop on a train or a trolley. Totally. And... And listening to my intuition and avoiding that drive, I have to sometimes remind myself I'm not some kind of pansy or square that doesn't want a car, doesn't want to be on the highway or whatever. I'm listening Brew, to my right? inner voice that a lot beep, of people are ignoring. That well, everybody yeah, is it, yeah. like, yeah. No, to, I, I, want, I want to add some numbers here real quick, yeah, if ahead. that's okay. Just yeah. real quick here. Uh, I, I read once that um, they did a study on changing people's commute from, from like a 45 minute commute to a five minute commute. And it increased their happiness overall more than anything other than falling in love. So the average American spends 18 Beautiful. days driving per year, which is around eight hours and 22 minutes per week. That's an entire another working day. Imagine all of you, if you had a whole, basically like half a month of vacation a year and an entire other day, every single week of stuff that you could do. That's what you are, you were tithing to the car. That is what the beast demands. If something fell into my lap tomorrow, I would be really good at not working. And I, I, I say that because I've worked my whole, I've, I started working when I was nine years old. Um, and I've had, I've been very lucky in my career to be able to actually do something that I care about and I make a good living and so on and so forth. But I very intentionally chose a pathway that freed me of car dependence quite a long time ago. So 22 years ago, I was like, you know what? Because I was, I was living in the mountains. I was earning $14,000 a year. And my truck broke down one winter. And I realized, like, I'm screwed. I'm really screwed. Like, I don't have the money to fix this thing. I was sleeping on couches. I could barely get home half the week. And so I just had this little light bulb go off my head. Like, yeah, that, that's the problem right there. It's like, if, if, if this had happened and I were living somewhere I could walk everywhere, I wouldn't be freaked out about it. So I'm going to choose to live somewhere where I never have to worry about this again. And I, and I moved, I moved to the Bay area. I mentioned that because to your point, Zachary, about, you know, how much free time I actually never drive now, except to go somewhere like to the mountains or if I have to go over, my sister lives in Oregon. So I go up there a couple times a year to see my sister, but the amount of free time I have would blow people's like, Matt, how do you, how do you, how are you so relaxed? Like what, why, how, how comes it? It seems like sometimes you're not that busy. And I'm like, because I'm not spending 10, 15 hours a week in the car, I'm spending that time chilling out. And I mean chilling out. I don't mean like trying to be more productive member of society. I'm like, I'm not like trying literally to like, chilling. I'm not trying to like make more money on the side. I'm like, no, no, like it's free time. I have free time. And that's a radical concept. And I think I think that this is something that I really hope, especially people on the left could really understand, is we're actually this close. We are really this close to to a somewhat ideal scenario where you actually don't have to work as hard or as much right like isn't this what marx was really writing about like like we we contribute and reproduce but you don't have to like become the producer you're a person first like let's what about centering our humanity and cars just remove that entire margin they take it all right off the top not just because you're spending your time in it but then you're then tithing to it it's like it's yeah. time and money. And guess what? You get both of those things back to do whatever you want with if you're given the option of a car light or a car free lifestyle. And I'm looking around like, I have to say, like, I, I'm going to be, I got to be a little bit critical. Some folks on the left, I, they're like, they're like, well, but people need their cars to get to work. I'm like, yeah, that's the problem. 
<laughs> Come on, you guys. What kind of leftists right. are we if the answer to our vision is you've got to come up with $20,000 a year to give to this industrial fascist fucking industry so that you can do the things you love to do? Like, what about just not doing that and taking that 20 grand and doing whatever you like? And, and here's the thing. We never even owned the cars. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, well, I want to, I aspire to own this and I aspire to have that. And you still never own it because for the rest of your life, as a good friend of mine was pointing out the other day, um, you are taxed on it over and over and over in various ways throughout your entire life. Even if you could manage to pay off a car these days. Yeah, you've got tags. You've got your road taxes. You've got your insurance. tickets you pay when you go a little bit over the speed limit. It's you've got your insurance, which is useless. It's endless. Um, yeah. So it's endless. It's a, it's an endless, it's a treadmill and you never catch up. It's a trap. I mean, the only piece yeah. of advice I can give for people who really either want to, or for fate have to drive a car is like the most important thing for me to do is never, ever, ever buy a new car, never buy a new car. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of anybody doing. It is such a waste of money. And now the <laughs> average new car is $45,000. And I'm looking around like, yeah. I make a good living. I don't know how the hell people come up with that kind of money for a car. Like, I'm like, I, where did you? I'm with that? you. Well, it, it it's it's a it keeps us in the real endless wheel of wheel within a wheel, which is debt. It keeps people perpetually in oh, debt. And, right. you know? and don't even get me started on these new lending regimes that that the banks have come up with the subprime car loans, where it's a oh my god, this is scandalous. So the banks now. Wow, all, that's that's amazing. I mean, offer, just just to, to really quickly, like like bubble. I was just going to say that it's a bubble in a bubble. I mean, but like. The subprime mortgage crisis was like wrecked. It was like people were like, "The end is nigh," and we're doing this with cars. We're doing with cars, like how much more how, fragile could this infrastructure be? This is how this is how bad this is. The, the, to get a car loan now, if you're low income and you have bad credit, the banks will write you a six year loan, ten percent interest. Okay, the car, if it's under lease, you got to return it in three or five years, and guess what? It's worth less than the amount you owe on the loan at that time. Yeah. So you oh, now yeah. you now you're getting your next car, and in addition to the loan for that car, you're going to still be paying off the loan for the last car because they're structuring these things so that each time you do it again, it just layers a whole nother layer of money on top of the money you're paying before. So that's debt transfer. It's insane, and I think there's a whole. I think that something. There's a one really, really, really big project for the whole left to get its head around is if I if it could really change the world is just help our brothers and sisters get the basics of how this finance works. Because people are making decisions under duress. They don't understand what they're getting themselves into. It's catastrophic for them personally. And once you're in, it is almost impossible to get out. You are so screwed if you take a car loan under these terms. And, that, and then you're just stuck. And you're like, oh, man, what am because I doing? Because then now, now I'm, working, your now, credit's I'm not just working for the car industry. Now I'm also working for the bank. And that's what makes yeah. people real bitter about the system. But I'm here saying, like, if we change our land use patterns, if we take some of this $3.5 trillion and make it so that we're collectively investing in transit systems that we can all use for $2 a day. I tell every, everybody's like, how much do you spend on transportation, Matt? I'm like, uh, $100 a month? $100 a month. Hundred dollars a month. That's what I spend. Bus, train, ride my bike, walk. It's a hundred dollars a month. And people look at and me, so and it's social that activity much too. And gas a you know? week. I'm, and and while you're you know. in transport, you can read a book. I'm reading you can listen to a podcast. Podcast. You're not manually white knuckling it. You I'm know? sleeping. I mean, yeah, it, it's all of these things. And I think that I think that Americans, too many Americans, just have not had that experience. They don't even know it's possible. And we've got to really start to change both you know, their awareness of like how much harm is being caused to them by these financial products and that, that are really designed to keep them stuck in their cars. But also it doesn't have to be that way. You know, there was a time in our country's past, not that long ago, where it, when it wasn't that way. And I think that the project of the rest of the century is getting us back to that. Now, I don't mean like anti-growth or like anti-technology. I actually think there's a lot of spectacular things we're going to achieve with things like renewable energy technologies, like all of these other sustainability efforts that are going on. But the crux of all of this is around giving people their money back for mobility and letting them live in places 
where they feel more part of a community, where they can walk to the things they need. Where like, like imagine, like when I was a kid, we used to kids used to run rampant through the neighborhood. That doesn't happen anymore. Imagine letting your kids run outside and not worrying about them getting run over. Like that's or your a pets. really strong selling point, I think, for a lot of people. Is like your kids could go yeah. play ball in the street again if we took care of this problem. If you said that to most people today, they'd be like, "You're crazy! I'm not going to let my kid play in the street." That's the right answer for now, but it wasn't always that way. Right. Right. I had a dystopian moment. I'll just say this really quickly so we can get to solutions, Marlo. Um, I had a dystopian moment recently, as we all increasingly are these days. Um, and I don't know if you all are aware of it. I was, and I guess because where I try to be so non-secular um, and not pay attention to some of the things around me um, so I can stay positive, I was driving down the road um, and I, I drove by this huge gas station. Um, it's not quite a Bucky's, but it's a really big one, right? And it just happened to um, catch my eye, these words that were scrolling across the, uh, the price uh, of gas, a gallon. And they now have an easy pay option for your gas stop. You know how you can easy pay for your bit, your dinner, your pizza delivery or whatever. You can break it down into payments like that wasn't dystopian enough. Now you can break down your gallon of gas into payments. You can break down your um, your fill up into payments. It is just ridiculous and absolutely hilarious. The lens to which this empire, this this um, establishment is going to to cling to it, the only way it knows how to operate. And that is to squeeze us all dry. Of, of whatever they can get from us. And uh, I don't know, I just found it hilarious and very dystopian. The one thing I want to say about that is is it's it's true for the banks that write car loans and for the car industry. But where, where that starts to, where I think there's, again, an opportunity for coalition building is with the other businesses. Because one thing that happens in cities and towns that start to remove cars from their business districts, business booms. And the retailers in those areas yeah. make more money. The restaurants make more money. Why? Because people have more money to spend. Because people have more money. And I think this is a really critical piece for our movement to recognize is that there's a lot of losers in car culture and only a couple winners. And if you start to pull that money back, a lot more people get to win. And so because politics being what it is, you need a big coalition to achieve change. I think we have to make sure that we're thinking about not just that there's a part of the system that is a vampire sucking our blood, but there's another part that are our neighbors, our, our friends who own businesses at the local level, our, our friends who make crafts and sell them at, at, at flea markets and fairs. Like They are the beneficiaries just as much as we are if we start to claw back this wealth from being stolen from us by the car industry, because then it's like, mm -hmm. well, like I talk about, I chill out a lot. I do a lot of my chilling out. I ride a bicycle and my bike mechanic is the beneficiary of that. Right. Like, right. I, like I say, I'm spending a hundred dollars a month on transport, probably like three, $400 of that a year goes to him. <laughs> and that, that's a, that's a direct community impact direct versus community going to a benefit. corporation. Right. It's, it's really the key to having sustainable local economies is this particular question we've got to get cars out of being the center of our local economies it's a critical task so i think this is going to be kind of a shorter episode here but i, I think it's like in the spirit of like looking at this as an addiction you know it's like the first step is recognizing you have a problem i uh, was really I I interested and and excited to get you on the show one because you know Come on, you just fucking nailed it. You blew this <laughs> this problem apart, you know, as good as you possibly could. But I think it's yeah. it's really because the, I'm excited by the prospect of what a visionary ramification with well, the the visionary ramifications of this single move are enormous, and yeah. they just really invite. And I want to end this episode. Not we're not going to get into the whole solution of how do we design this sort of city, how do we re restructure our society, what could we do, you know, in a, in with public transportation and things like that. That's a whole other conversation that, you know, I'd love for you to come on the show again and participate in. But for now, I want to just invite the listeners when you're stuck in traffic, instead of, you know, white knuckling it and screaming at the people around you, try to start thinking about imagining what all this land and space could be, you know, start seeing as I do all the cars on the highway as junk, as things, materials in a scarce world that could be turned into anything. I think about. I was thinking about this the other day that the, there's a there was a one time pulse of carbon, of, of fossil energy, that humanity discovered that we are about at the end of, and what 
did we use that energy, that amazing thing that allowed us to perform? Every barrel of oil is is just many, many times the amount of work that we could do that a, a, even a whole group of people can do. One barrel of oil can do. I mean, we, this is an amazing substance for all the damage that it has done. It gave us an opportunity, literally a one-time opportunity for us to restructure our entire civilization, to turn it into whatever we want. And you think about all the metal, all the plastic, all the material that goes into these giant hulking machines. We could have made anything. And what did we do with mm. that? We are burning that shit to power the most inefficient kind of engine imaginable so we can sit in a Bucky's parking lot <laughs> and stuff French fries in our face. Yeah. That is crazy. And catch that, the ocean. That, that is on so fire. crazy. Nothing, nothing, that, that nothing against the Bucky's French me. fries. Um, but I got I got a Bucky's bit that I don't have time to go into here, no, but I'll put okay. it in the, I, in the, the one thing uh, I hope the, 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 the one thing I hope that everybody understands, this is this is the this is the sort of the red pill moment for folks, because they really do have agency here. Every time you go out on the street, every time you see a parking lot, remind yourself that's yours. That land belongs to you. That land belongs to all of us. That street wasn't like, it doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't belong to the car industry. It, it belongs to all of us collectively. And what that means is that if enough of us raise our voices about that ownership, we can actually force our cities. And that's what a lot of us are doing. And we're, trust me, it's, it's, it's not easy. We're, there's a lot of shouting that happens. There's a lot of anger. There are a lot of people who will do anything to defend their car against you, including threatening to kill you. But the reality is, What's the alternative? Living the wrong life and then dying? That's not for me. I'd rather, I'd rather live the right life. And I think recognizing that all this land that we're surrounded by that was stolen from us by the car industry, that's not a permanent situation. We don't have to let that be a permanent situation. And if we're going to make these improvements to our society, I talked about free college, free health care. Like, the money's there, guys. We've got the money. Let's take it back. Let's take back the land that the car industry stole from us. That's the pathway to solutions. Psst. Money's not real. It's made up out of debt. It's just numbers in a computer. It's not a real limitation. You don't just want money. You want freedom from the system that enslaves you to money and access to the things that it keeps you from. But seriously, folks, we couldn't go one whole episode on moneyless society without reminding you that money is a social construct. It's not real in a biological and scientific sense, and it has no real relationship to the real resource capacity of the earth, which is our true limitation. Everything else is a social construct derived from this giant, crazy world game of infinite colonization that reduces nature's bounty, into a prison of reliance on corporations and private entities making us go through them to barely exist. This show really is part one to a larger conversation. We really only discussed the problem and it's such a big problem we didn't even get into the truly systemic nature of why car culture is the way that it is, why these corporations have such power over us, why things don't change, why the world is the way that it is which ultimately is a system problem. Just like an automobile is a system of components that work together to make it run over a four-year-old <laughs> as, it, as it rushes you late to work, our political, social, economic, and infrastructural systems, our transportation systems, our monetary systems, our education systems, our media systems are all a part of a larger system that all needs redesign. That's the solution, that we can't just change pieces. We have to change the whole. And what that looks like is a conversation for another episode for many more episodes <laughs> stay tuned keep listening we're going to answer them and help the, you the listener find the tools to imagine that world for yourself because ultimately as we like to say many worlds are possible <laughs>